got to come up with a better way to warn Coloradans when wildfires blow up quickly, like the East Troublesome did a year ago today. We head back to Grand County, where they're trying a different approach. Candidates are exploiting a loophole for nicknames to put their political messages on the ballot. How long have you gone by the nickname No Mandates? Long enough. Childhood nickname? <laughs> of course not. This state's COVID hospitalizations are at a high for 2021 and still rising. Time to talk about how many ICU beds are open. Colorado has some beautiful places with ugly names. Changing them hasn't been simple. These are issues that are sometimes complicated, always important, occasionally odd. This is next. We are so accustomed to our cell phones blowing up with emergency alerts. It's easy to forget how much of Colorado does not have reliable cell service. These are places that are often prone to wildfires or floods, where it's imperative to get people that early warning. Like up in Grand County, where one year ago tonight, the East Troublesome fire grew out of control. Our Mark Salinger looks at how that fire is changing evacuation notices. There's a reason people live in the middle of nowhere. I've lived all over the world and this is much better. <laughs> For Ryan Fosha. Drowsy Water, we're uh, a family owned uh, guest and dude ranch. Rural Grand County is home even if it comes with some challenges. The emergency response is a lot different than, you know, say in a place with more coverage. The call from the sheriff's office to evacuate from the East Troublesome Fire came quick. You know, when we were lucky, we had about two hours to evacuate. A year later, there's a new layer of protection yeah. handing on the walls of the ranch. <laughs> Cell coverage is very limited up here, so the, this is a way to uh, more readily you know, access or give that information to people quicker. The fire made clear that people in rural Colorado need more ways to receive emergency notifications. Now Grand County is giving out free weather radios that can warn of emergencies like floods and fires. It sends out a loud beeping noise and then after that it'll provide information on what type of emergency it is. The alerts when we get them here. Matt Reed lives outside Grand Lake. Yeah. And gets his emergency Four, notifications three, over one. text, just like the one he got one year ago tonight telling him to leave immediately. We had 14 minutes notice to leave. And uh, I was by myself with two dogs and a three-year-old at the time. Now he's rebuilding and worries about floods coming down from the burn scar. He tried to get a weather radio from the county, but the 150 they had ran out fast. They need to expand it and get it to people that are trying to get it. Neither fire nor flood will push people to move away from a place like this. We had upwards of 30 firefighters helping protect as well too, so we were very lucky. Even in the middle of nowhere, there's one more way of telling them when it's time to leave for just a little. The alerts come from the National Weather Service, but the Office of Emergency Management can also request that messages be sent out through the civil alert system. That'll go to phones, which is, of course, the way that most people get their emergency alerts. Now, Kyle, after the fire, this main concern over the past year mm -hmm. has been flash floods coming down sure. through that burn star and destroying even more homes. Sure. So, I mean, that's the thing. We know now when there's a devastating fire that it's going to be years of danger it's a cycle. In, in those communities. Uh, how about the, the demand for those radios? Yeah, they went through 150 real quick. Now the county has a grant through the Red Cross to try and get more of those. Mm -hmm. We'll see when that comes. Another interesting factor in all of this, they're trying to get a Doppler radar system to come into Grand County, and that'll give them better weather uh, forecasting so mm -hmm. that they can warn people even sooner if there's a storm coming in or anything like that so that they can get out. Super localized weather alerts now that they've got that increased danger. Really interesting. Pretty interesting. Thank you, Mark. Political candidates in Colorado are allowed to use their nicknames when they appear on the ballot. No way that would be abused, right? As long as there's no timeline or um, no quantifiable way to say what is or is not a nickname, then a nickname just happens to be a nickname. And I fully expect in the future other people will say, you know what, I have a nickname. And whether they do or don't is not my business. But for today, on this particular ballot, it is my business. His name, he would have us believe, is Blake No Mandates Law. That's how he'll appear on the Thompson School Board ballot for voters in Larimer, Boulder, and Weld County. Larimer County Clerk and Recorder Angela Myers, a Republican, said that state law allows candidates to sneak in a political statement like that if they claim that it is their nickname. I prefer not to have things like this on the ballot. Um, I, um, I 
for me, it opens the watershed. Probably we're going to have this in every election for somebody. So I think it is a, a uh, part of the law that probably needs a little bit tightening up in my mind. Here's what the law currently says. Each candidate can include one nickname on the ballot if they regularly use it, like our friend No Mandates, everybody knows him by No Mandates, uh, and if it doesn't include any part of a political party's name. Clerk Meyer says beyond that, she doesn't get to pick and choose which, which nicknames go on the ballot based on whether she thinks that they're legit. When it comes to politics, you don't have to agree, but let's just vote. Time to cover another statewide ballot issue. And if it's an election year, you can bet that we're talking about property taxes. Proposition 120 on your statewide ballot deals with assessment rates. That's the math that determines how much you pay in property taxes. It's a confusing topic, though it should sound familiar because you voted on something similar last year. As politics guy Marshall Zellinger explains, this is a ballot issue voted on by everyone, yet it only affects some people's property taxes. Proposition 120 has a lot of math. I mean, look at all the numbers. A yes vote means you want to lower the property tax assessment rate for certain property owners. The assessment rate is part of the equation that determines your property tax bill. A yes vote would lower the rate for multifamily homeowners and commercial lodging properties like hotels. This would not lower the rate for single family homeowners or condo owners. A no vote means you don't want to lower the assessment rate. This comes with an asterisk because of a bill the legislature approved this year. Here. More on that in a moment. Taxable value is your property value multiplied by the assessment rate. That total is used to pay the districts where you live. Here's a city of Centennial example that I've shown before of where property tax money goes. Let's go back. Last year, voters passed an amendment that froze the assessment rates, 7.15% for homes, 29% for non-residential property. So why did some of you get higher property tax bills this year? Because this part of the equation, the value of your property, went up. Every other year, the county assessor revalues property. So once again, you're being asked to lower this part of the equation. A yes vote on Proposition 120 lowers the assessment rate, just not for everyone, for multifamily homes, except for condos, and for hotels, motels, and B&Bs. A lower assessment rate could mean a lower property tax bill and perhaps less money for all these areas in your city and county. So why are single-family homes, condos, and most commercial property excluded from Proposition 120? State lawmakers, that's why. Earlier this year, the legislature created new categories for property, separating single-family homes and condos from multifamily homes, separating lodging property from other commercial property. Lawmakers also approved a temporary drop for multifamily assessment rates. So even if Proposition 120 fails, lawmakers have already approved a two-year drop in the assessment rate for multifamily homes, which will go back up in 2024. Clear as mud. Here is the kicker. Kyle, there are more than 2 million residences in Colorado, and because of what the state legislature did earlier this year, a yes vote only changes the assessment rate for 166,000 of those. That's 8% of residences. So, Marshall, one thing that we're seeing quite a bit of lately is that Republicans who are having a difficult time getting into elected offices are using ballot issues and propositions mm -hmm. to get conservative ideas advanced. And this is, again, something we've talked about in the past with the assessment rate. But because the election didn't happen until November and the legislature met earlier this year, Democrats at the legislature said, what can we do that would impact this ballot measure before people even vote on it? And that's why it's so confusing, because lawmakers did something they legally could do by changing definitions, but this had already qualified for the ballot, and so you're voting on something where the definitions changed after the fact. It's only a matter of time till candidates uh, start using the nickname like "No New Taxes" as well. That'd be a good that'd be a good nickname, or or "Fund Schools." That's another great nickname. Thanks for your help with the nickname story as well, Jay Marshall. Happy Throwback Thursday, everyone. Day when we celebrate Retro Colorado. And today, you know who helped us out with this? The athletic department at Boston College, specifically their men's hockey team. Somebody on, on Twitter flagged us on this. The ticket website for Boston College hockey uh, is kind of got an old school look for Colorado College and the University of Denver. Uh, the old Tigers logo, that was the one they had for 30 years before it was upgraded last year. That Pios logo, remember they flopped all around when they got rid of Boone because he was offensive? Uh, that logo has not been used by DU since 2006. 
The schedule section for BC Hockey does have the current logos of the teams that they're about to play. I'm sure they don't really care, but it's kind of funny to us. Imagine arriving at a beautiful spot, only to see it's named after a racist slur for you or your family. Coloradans are trying to change that bit of history. This state's going in the wrong direction with COVID hospitalizations to the point that it could become an ICU bed availability issue. Colorado's health department is sending out COVID tests with a return address in Nevada. Next for your ask why, I mean, don't we have labs here? That's a good question. The answer, next. COVID hospitalizations are dropping nationwide, not in Colorado. And state health leader said today we are getting thin on ICU beds. Hospitalizations are rising among all age groups here, especially people 70 and older. State epidemiologist Rachel Hurley, he said that what we may be looking at is waning immunity in the older population that got the vaccine first. Today, Dr. Hurley encouraged eligible Coloradans to go get boosters. Hospitalizations have now topped 1,100 for the first time this year. There are now 1,130 Coloradans with a bad enough case of COVID that they have to be in the hospital. That is up 36 patients from yesterday. State health leaders say, not surprisingly, you got counties with low vaccination rates that have some of the highest hospitalization rates. The state's COVID-19 incident commander, Scott Bookman, said today that 90% of the state's ICU beds are full. That is a jump of almost 20% since the summer. Bookman says we're looking at approximately 120 free ICU beds statewide. As we look at our latest vaccination numbers, it, they've been inching along and we finally topped 60% of people in Colorado who have completed the vaccination process. More than 3.5 million of our neighbors. Yesterday, I received COVID-19 at home rapid tests through the program that the CDPHE is putting on. When I looked at the return address, I noticed that it said Colorado Department of Health and Environment, North Las Vegas, Nevada. I was wondering why would they be in North Las Vegas, Nevada and not based in Colorado? Excellent question, Matt and Ingwood. There's the return address on the package that Matt received. So what gives? Why is CDPHE's mail getting outsourced to Nevada? We asked them and they said that what you're seeing there is that they've partnered with Amazon on rapid at home testing. The address listed is not where the package is shipped from. It's the Amazon fulfillment center where it should be returned if it's undeliverable. So it's still the local uh, state health department. That's just the fulfillment center if we've got spare tests. Keep the questions coming. Record a video or audio message of you asking the question. Email next at 9news.com. As always, we'll work to get answers and we all get smarter together. That was a beautiful start to the day despite those clouds out there. Mountain wave cloud kind of draped across the city, but still a spectacular sunrise. This afternoon, this evening, those clouds moving out, the blue skies moving in. You can see it tonight on HD Doppler 9, those clouds now shifting into southeastern Colorado. Tonight, temperatures falling into the 30s for the metro, 20s, 30s, way up high. And the future cast not showing us much. Tomorrow morning, we kick off the day with plenty of sunshine. High level clouds, though, drifting in by about 4 or 5 o'clock here in the city, but it should be a dry day statewide. High pressure is around, but series of storms will be impacting the West Coast, bringing them some really heavy rain. Tomorrow, temperatures warming into the 70s for the metro area, 50s, 60s, way up high. We'll keep the clouds with us over the weekend. Mild temperatures, though, and possibly a few isolated showers next Tuesday afternoon. The names of some places in Colorado would not have raised eyebrows a century ago, but now it's like, really want to say that aloud? When we rename these places, it's really not about discarding old history. A complicated discussion about making Colorado for everyone. Next. Gorgeous places in Colorado, mountains, canyons, creeks that have some really ugly names, names rooted in racism or ignorance or both. And we still say them and re reference these places because, well, it's the name on that piece of geography. Perhaps not for long. Here's Brian Wendland. On its face, a name might seem like just a name. There is a gulch in Chafee County called Chinaman Gulch. 
It's east of Johnson Village near Trout Creek. And today the Colorado Geographic Naming Advisory Board had a meeting to talk about um, several actually derogatory names of geographic features across the state. But Joey Ha with Colorado Asian Pacific United says below the surface, a name can have terrible meaning. It was used often as a racist slur um, used by politicians to feel hatred, distress, and prejudice. Um, and it contributed to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The Colorado Geographic Naming Advisory Board is considering changing the names of at least six landmarks, some that include racial slurs. I think renaming the Gulch is a step towards like enhancing diversity and inclusion in our community as a whole. So these place names are really important because they're a common cultural touchstone. Sam Bach is a public historian with History Colorado. He says while there is history behind many of the names, What's important is ensuring the names of our outdoor spaces are inclusive of everyone. When we rename these places, it's really not about discarding old history. It's really about making sure that they're public spaces that are open and free to everybody who wants to use them. For next, I'm Brian Wendland. Democratic Governor Jared Polis popped into the renaming board's meeting today. Uh, he authorized the board and he offered an observation that felt pretty cringy to some in the room. The governor suggested that some indigenous names are too tough to pronounce. Democratic State Representative Adrian Benavides reminded the governor that working past some people's inability to pronounce names from outside their own culture is part of the point here. Yesterday, uh, one of our senior staffers told me that the name he recommended was Mestahehe. Today, they sent me a uh, pronunciation guide that said it's Mestahe. But it's really not within the realm of, um, of, of comprehension for normal uh, readers that are literate to be able to read the uh, phonetic version that was uh, supplied. A name like mine is often mispronounced and you correct people. That's not, in my mind, a good reason um, to avoid using names. Um, that's really problematic, and I think it undermines trying to um, weave through the different cultures that make up our state. Mestahe was a notable Cheyenne woman in the 1800s. That advisory board's meeting again next month. Public can weigh in on potential name changes. You weigh in at the end of every program. We'll do your feedback next. Your feedback gets the final word. Mary Carroll in Longmont writes in to say, after receiving my ballot, as well as the blue book, I can't determine the candidate's political affiliation, party affiliation. She says, even after researching the candidates, doesn't seem to be any answer. So, Mary Carroll, what you have come across is what Marshall talked to us about the other night, the fact that municipal elections in Colorado are nonpartisan. They often feature people who affiliate with a political party, often very active in that political party, but the party does not appear alongside their name. We talked about the pros and cons of that. If you want to vote based on party affiliation in a municipal election, there's an easy way to do it. Look up the voting guide of the party you like or the party you don't, and vote for or against their suggestions. A reminder, you can find all of Marshall's political reporting on 9news.com, including his ballot explainers on the big issues you're facing. See you next time.